Hi, I'm Sarah Ray Werner, and I am the executive producer of the fantasy audio drama Omen. I'm also the creator of the science fiction audio drama Girl in Space. Rise of the Rule Lords uses trademarks and or copyrights owned by Paizo Incorporated, used under Paizo's community use policy. We are expressly prohibited from charging you to use or access this content. Rise of the Rule Lords is not published, endorsed, or specifically approved by Paizo. For more information about Paizo Incorporated and Paizo products, please visit paizo.com. And be sure to check out omencast.com for more swashbuckling adventures. And remember, don't let the rules rule you. Look, everyone, I can make this last for as long as I want now. As long as I want. Okay, it's time for Rise of the Rule Lords! Welcome to a very special episode of Rise of the Rule Lords. I'm your tubular and righteous rule lord, Pete. Why is this episode so special? Because it's an episode. I know, it's been a while. This unwanted hiatus was brought to you by Clinical Depression. Remember kids, when your head doctor tells you to take your mind medicine, do it. It helps your brain make the good stuff. But as one of my favorite podcasts of all time, The Adventure Zone, said, the antidote to despair is action, and that's exactly what we're going to be talking about today. Actions! If you know anything about Pathfinder 2nd Edition, it's that the three-action economy is probably one of the biggest and most innovative changes that's been made to tabletop roleplay games. A wagering adventurer might even think that when D&D 5.5 comes out, you're going to see a slight change to their action economy. Maybe it'll look like Pathfinder 2nd Edition. I don't know. Could happen. But regardless, when you have a turn, mostly in combat, in Pathfinder 2nd Edition, you're granted three actions. Each action is delineated by a little diamond shape that either has one, two, or three markings next to it. This shows the cost of that action, so you can use these actions in any order as long as you have the economy for it. You can do a two action with a single action, use all three actions, do three single actions, whatever you want. What we'll be going over are called the basic actions. These are actions available to anyone, regardless of background, ancestry, or class. Even the monsters of Pathfinder 2nd Edition have access to this moveset. Even more specialized actions, like ones granted by class, use these base set of actions as the starting template. For example, the class feat Power Attack doesn't try to reinvent the wheel. Rather, it uses the language of use a melee strike, and then grants some extra bits, saying that not only does this count towards your multiple attack penalty, but you also deal an extra damage die. That's not completely reinventing strike, it's using the base of strike to improve upon it. So it's really important that you have a basic understanding of all of these basic actions. So without further ado, let's start going over these actions in the descending order of how likely you are to use it during your Pathfinder career, meaning the actions that you're most likely to use in any given game. Starting with Stride. 
I bet you guys thought I was going to go right to attacks, but no, you're likely going to move a lot more than you're going to attack. Stride has a very simple description. You move up to your speed. Now what is your speed? Well, when you were creating a character, you likely noticed that each ancestry has a different speed listed on the little sidebar on the front page of the core rulebook. Most start at 25, but some can start with a little bit higher or a little bit lower, generally depending on the size of the creature. Every 5 feet equals 1 square or 1 hexagon, depending on the map type that you're using, on the map of your terrain. So 25 feet would be either 5 squares or 5 hexagons. Let's just stick with squares because that's the base set that Pathfinder maps use, even though hexagons are way better! So if you have a speed of 25, that means that you can move five squares in any direction. Now as a reminder, every second diagonal square that you move is 10 feet, meaning that if you have a speed of 25 and move three diagonal squares, you're actually moving 20 feet, not 15. That's five feet for the first square, 10 feet for the second diagonal square, and then another five feet for the third diagonal square. So as you've already used up 20 feet of your 25 movement speed, that means that you can't move another diagonal square. Though you could move straight or to the side just fine. Now even though that math is a little bit confusing, overall you'll actually be moving faster using that than by going up 3 squares then to the side another 2. Trust me, it works. Now because of all the extra actions that you get compared to 1st edition or different D&D games, that means that maps should really be utilizing space when creating combat encounters. You should have players moving all over the place, as well as creatures chasing players, moving all across the space, getting into flanking positions, running away. Really, people should be moving like a chessboard all over the place. That's a very big distinction between how combat worked in 1st edition and how it works in 2nd edition. But the other big change is that hardly any creatures have something called Attack of Opportunity. In 1st edition, every single creature had Attack of Opportunity, whether it was a sorcerer, a warrior, or any various creature. This really halted combat movement a lot. People were scared to move between monsters or even run away because it always opened up an Attack of Opportunity. Now it's far less frequent, however it does still exist. This leads us to the second move that we're going to talk about today. Step. Step moves you 5 feet. Now why would you want to do that rather than just make another stride? Well, Step has the important distinction that it doesn't trigger movement based reactions. If you're going up against a creature or as a GM against a player that has attack of opportunity, you can move 5 feet and it will not trigger attack of opportunity. Keep in mind you don't have to step to disengage from combat. This is just extra precaution so that you can save yourself a little bit of battle damage. If you really need to get a far distance, for example to help another player, maybe it's worth chancing that attack of opportunity. But if you're low on health or just a squishy character, step can help you from taking a lot of damage from doing a very simple move. Now this is a move where we have our first set of requirements. Your speed has to be at least 10 feet. For most characters, this is hardly worth mentioning. Again, you're probably starting at least at 20 feet movement speed. But there are some slow creatures in the bestiary, most notably the sloth. If you want to have the saddest Pathfinder fight ever, have your characters fight a sloth with its 5 feet of movement speed. However, it still is possible. Most heavy armors impose a minus 10 to your speed. You could also be either a dwarf or an Azarketi, who automatically have a 20 foot ancestral movement speed. Plus, if you're encumbered, you take a minus 10 foot penalty to all of your speeds as well. Any of those combinations can make you slower than 10 feet, meaning that you can no longer step. You also can't step into difficult terrain, regardless of your ancestry. You also can't use an alternate speed like swimming or digging to be able to say that you can move faster than 10 feet. Now all those contingencies to make you break that requirement of having at least 10 foot movement speed are pretty uncommon, so most of the time you don't even have to think about it. The simple rule then is that a step 
will keep you from triggering movement-based reactions. Now before we get much further, I want to remind you all that the specific overrides the general in Pathfinder 2nd Edition. That means that if there's a spell or a feat that changes any one of these rules, you get to go buy that new set. Players can use spells, potions, or even other players' feats to grant them increases in speed, both to steps and to stride. That's right, you could have a 10-foot step. So remember, these are all baseline rules. If you have any cool abilities, and there are many, that let you change any of these, make sure that you utilize them. There is no basic action that has more variations caused by class feats, normal feats, spells, than strike. Strike is the basic attack action for any character. It comes in several different varieties. Melee weapon, ranged weapon, and unarmed. Now remember, the weapon trait for unarmed simply says that you use your body rather than a manufactured weapon. So that doesn't mean that you just have to throw hands when you do an unarmed attack. You can be using your feet, your head, hell, even your butt. That said, if you are holding two things in your hands and then you say you want to do an unarmed strike, your GM is probably going to say no. In either of those cases, you have to be in range of whatever you're attacking. So for a melee weapon, you have to be within reach. Typically, this is 5 feet for most weapons, though there are longer ones like pole arms that have a 10 foot reach. For ranged weapons, you need to be able to hit them, meaning that they shouldn't be behind another object, and should have a clear line of sight to them, as well as them being in range of whatever you're shooting with. Now, as long as those are met, regardless of what weapon you're using, you'll make an attack roll using our favorite D20 dice. You'll add up any modifiers that you have for the weapon, including your own proficiency with the weapon, circumstance bonuses, item bonuses, and status bonuses, as well as any penalties that are being inflicted on you. If after all that math, the number that you rolled with all of your modifiers exceeds the armor class of whatever you're trying to hit, you get to do damage to them. Your damage will also be calculated based off of the base damage that your weapon does, as well as modifiers from circumstance, item, or status penalties and bonuses. That is probably the most boring way to say that you get to hit things really hard. Nevertheless, all of this math is an integral part of playing Pathfinder 2nd Edition as well as most other tabletop roleplay games that use the D20 system. The combination of having to see if you can even hit something, as well as how much damage that you do, simulates randomness. Through your own various life experiences, you should know that even when you succeed sometimes, you don't always succeed the best that you possibly can. This is why even when you get a strike, you also have to calculate the damage, which could mean that you roll a 1 plus whatever your modifier is, doing barely anything to your enemy. But it makes the next thing so satisfying when you get a critical success. This is when the math used to calculate your attack exceeds the armor class of your enemy by 10 points or more. You can also commonly get a critical success by rolling a natural 20 on the d20 die, which increases your level of success by one degree. Again, this is a very boring way of saying you hit things really hard. A critical success allows you to take whatever damage you would normally do and double it. Simple as that. Now there is no hard rule that says that you can't roll your damage twice, then add those two together. If you want to do it, that's perfectly fine. The benefits of doing the former is that you can get an overall higher score very often. The benefits of the latter are that you'll hit in a more median range. Or to put it simply, doubling your dice means hit harder most of the time, doing your dice rolls twice means hitting better most of the time. Now the caveats to strike are that if you try to hit more than once, you take a multiple attack penalty. The multiple attack penalty is a minus 5 on the second strike and a minus 10 on the third. The most common way to circumvent this is to use an Agile weapon. Weapons with the Agile trait have a minus 4 and a minus 8 respective multiple attack penalty. 
In either case, both of these penalties drastically reduce your chances of being able to successfully hit another creature. It doesn't make it impossible, but it does make it very, very hard, especially for that third strike. This is the developer's way of saying, try other things. You absolutely have the freedom to stand there trying to hit something three times. Sometimes it'll work, often it'll work two out of three times, or most commonly one out of three times. But because the chances of hitting on that third strike are so low anyway, it's a great opportunity to try something else like grappling or running away or, or disarming or healing yourself or any number of other things. As you progress in the game, you're going to get a lot of items or spells that are going to help you improve on your ability to strike. Most notably, potency runes are things that can be etched onto your weapon to either increase the damage that you do or the attack bonus that you get. Many classes also have special feats that increase what you can do with a strike, such as power attack, flurry of blows, or hunt prey. These will usually either increase your attack bonus, increase the damage, or lower the multiple attack penalty that you get. In either case, it makes strike one of the most versatile basic actions that you will ever encounter. There are not only many ways to improve upon it, but many ways to try to make it so that things can't hit you. Raising a shield, putting on heavier armor, or a plethora of different kinds of spells can make it so that it's much harder for other things to hit you. However, that can go both ways. Monsters have certain abilities that can make it harder for you to strike against them, or abilities that make it easier for them to hit you. One of the ways that you can try to avoid taking this extra damage is to take cover. Take cover is a single action where you press yourself against a wall or duck behind an obstacle. Doing so can grant you various levels of cover, lesser, standard, or greater. Lesser cover is the most passive kind that you can get, often from already being behind another creature. However, if you use take cover, if you're near a feature that would allow you to take cover, you could get standard cover, which gives you a plus two to your AC. If you were already benefiting from standard cover, you could get greater cover, which gives you a plus four to your AC. Standard and greater cover also give you bonuses to reflex and stealth checks in the form of plus two for standard or plus four for greater cover. This makes cover not only a great way to avoid taking damage, but is also an important tool for those who like to be stealthy. As you can guess, standing in the middle of a room and then suddenly saying, I'm stealthy, uh, doesn't really work that way. However, if you go behind something, well, then you're actually stealthed and then can use all the benefits of all the different stealth actions that we'll be going over at a different time. The benefits of take cover will last until you either move, use an attack action, become unconscious, or the effect ends as a free action. Now, the important thing to keep in mind with cover is that it only lasts as long as there's something blocking you between the line of effect of another creature. So if you can draw a straight line between your character and the monster, and there's something blocking that, that's the cover. So if you take cover behind a box, and then a creature moves behind the box and is clearly able to see you, you might be ducking from cover, but you no longer have cover. So when taking cover, make sure that it's a place where you're actually going to be safe for a little bit. You also don't have to use an extra action to get out of cover. You can just be out of it as soon as you move or attack. Either way, it's treated as a free action, meaning an action that doesn't count against your already sparse action economy. Now, say that you did hide behind something, but a creature got behind you and grabbed you. Well, then you're going to need to try to escape. Escape is a single action to try to escape from being grabbed, immobilized, or restrained. There are three different kinds of roles you could choose to make to escape. Those could be an unarmed attack, acrobatics, or athletics check. All of those checks have to go against the DC of the creature grabbing you, be it athletics, thievery, or spell DC, depending on what they're using to grab you. Now the thing of it is, escape has the attack trait. What that means is that escape also suffers from the multiple attack penalty. I know, just when you thought it couldn't get any harder, it comes back at you. 
So if you're trying to escape and you fail the first attempt, you can try again, but you're going to take a minus 5, or if you have to do it three times, a minus 10 on the third escape attempt. But that means that it also benefits from the level of critical successes. On a normal success, you just get free. You're no longer grabbed, immobilized, or restrained by whatever the target is. But if you get a critical success, not only do you get free, but then you can also stride up to five feet. I don't know why they didn't just call it a step, but regardless. But it also means that you can critically fail. Obviously, a normal failure means that you're just still grabbed. But if you get a critical failure, not only do you not get free, you can't attempt another escape until your next turn. So why do you want to escape so bad? What really is so bad about being grabbed? Well, it puts the grabbed condition on you, which makes you flat-footed and immobilized. Those in the know will recognize that flat-footed means that you take a minus two penalty to your AC, meaning that while you're grabbed, it's going to be a lot easier for them to hit you. Immobilized similarly means that you can't go anywhere while they're doing it. And if you try to do anything that requires you to manipulate it, meaning that it has the manipulate trait on it, you have to succeed at a DC5 flat check, which is just a straight roll of the D20, seeing if you beat or exceed a 5. No penalties, no bonuses. Being immobilized and restrained have even worse consequences, so trying to get out as soon as you can is a really good move to make. Now it's possible whatever has you grabbed might also Release you. Release is a free action where when you're holding something in your hands, you just drop it. Now, why would you do this? You have this thing in your hands for a reason. You need to keep it there, right? Well, as you'll discover in your gaming time, there are feats that require you to have a free hand. And you can't really have a free hand if it's holding something. So if you have a sword in your shield and say you want to grab something, you're going to have to let one of those two things go. Now the good news is that release is a free action, meaning that you can just do it and it's not going to go against your action economy. Releasing also doesn't trigger reactions that might be affected by manipulate traits such as attack of opportunity. Now if something also were to release you, you might drop prone. This is a single action where you fall prone. Now prone is generally something that you don't want to be in. It makes you flat-footed, which means that you take a minus two penalty to AC, but it also means that you take a minus two penalty to attack rolls as well. The only move action that you can do while prone is to crawl and stand, which we'll go over in just a second. However, there is one good reason to fall prone, and that's to take cover to gain greater cover against ranged attacks. The benefit to this is, is that you don't even have to be hiding behind something. You just get that plus four bonus to AC. Plus you get to do your best Schwarzenegger impression and say, GET DOWN! Now say you're prone and you want to stay prone. You're probably crawling, which is where you move five feet and continue to stay prone. Now this is not the same thing as stepping. This is crawling, meaning that you still have all the negative effects of being prone. You're just on the ground and moving a lot slower. That said, there are reasons to crawl, like trying to move between air ducts or trying to stay behind greater cover. Now, if you don't want to be prone anymore, you have to stand. The stand action is a single action where you stand. You, you, were, you were prone and then you stand and you are no longer prone. That's the action. Now, the thing about stand is that while it does have a very short and unassuming description, it's actually one of the most powerful moves in the game. Why? Because stand is one of the shortest and simplest moves to inflict on someone else so that they lose one of their precious actions in their action economy. As we talked over, being prone is a very bad thing that you don't want to be in for very long. And the only action that you can take to get out of being prone is to stand. But stand comes with a slew of negative consequences and the only bonus that it gets is that you are no longer prone. You have to use an action to do basically nothing, which is in itself a huge consequence. But also stand has the move trait. While drop prone and crawl also have the move trait, 
while you're trying to stand means that you also open yourself up to an attack of opportunity. So not only are you essentially losing an action, but you're also opening yourself up to another attack. This makes an, an extremely powerful move, and you don't even have to cast a single spell to inflict it on someone. You only have to make them fall. And that's a lot of actions so far, and we still got a couple left to go. But before we do, let's take a brief trip to the Wares Wizard. Ah, salutations and tally ho! Welcome to the Wares Wizard! You may notice a couple of small changes. Vis a vis, there are no price tags anywhere. That is because sponsorships of any kind are now free to the public. If you have a Pathfinder 2nd Edition or System Neutral product, simply send us a 30 second ad or ad read and we'll air it. No money exchange at all. Sponsorships are still subject to approval and we'd really appreciate if on your own social media or medium that you would mention Rise of the Rule Lords. However, because this podcast values itself as a resource to the community, we want to provide a space for up and coming projects to be able to advertise themselves. And our first being Maker's Misfits. Do you like a badly run circus, opera singing goblins, and arguments about bears? Then I have a show for you. Hi, I'm Nathan, and I'm here to talk to you about a new actual play podcast called Maker's Misfits. Come listen to us as we play through The Extinction Curse, a Pathfinder 2nd Edition adventure path. You can check us out on any platform you listen to podcasts on, like Spotify or the Apple Podcast app. Wow, Wears Wizard, that really was something. But yes, I will no longer be charging for sponsorships for the foreseeable future. Like I've said before, I don't need money, and I really just want to get the message of Rise of the Rule Lords out there. So all you need to be able to sponsor on Rise of the Rule Lords is something to sponsor, and it'd be great if you mentioned us at some point. Is there any alternative motive to this? Well, you might figure that out if you do Sense Motive, a single action. Sense Motive used to be its own skill in Pathfinder 1st Edition, and D&D players might recognize it as an insight check. However, in 2e, it now falls under a perception check, the very, very big skill on your character sheet. Because perception now scales with every single character, you're able to roll a sense motive check pretty easily. However, this is also one of our first secret rolls on the basic skill move set. This means, players, that you will not actually be making this roll. In fact, it'll be your GM who makes the roll for you, asking what your perception modifier is, and then making a roll for you. The GM will then compare that roll to the deception DC of the creature, or the DC of a spell affecting the creature's mental state. This is one of those rolls that has various levels of success. However, players, you won't know what that is. Instead, your GM will tell you the information based on the outcome of the roll. Now, the true outcome of Sense Motive is that you're trying to tell if a creature's behavior is abnormal. So a successful roll will tell you if the creature is behaving normally, but you don't know exactly what its intentions might be, or if there's some kind of magic that might be affecting it. Note that a creature that's acting abnormally is a far cry from instantly knowing if they're telling the truth or not. Rather, you're looking at odd body language, signs of nervousness, or other indicators that they might be trying to deceive you. If anyone's ever watched the critically underrated show Lie to Me, you'll know about these things called micro-expressions. Things like sweaty palms, darting eyes, finger ticks, any of those kind of things. However, if you get a Cal Lightman level of insight, being a critical success, you'll determine the creature's true intentions and get a solid idea of any mental magic affecting it. On a failure, you believe what a deceptive creature wants you to believe. And if they're not being deceptive, then you believe that they're acting normally. And on a critical failure, you get a false sense of the creature's intentions. Because of these various levels of success, that's why it's so important that these roles remain secret between you and the GM. 
If you rolled a 1 or a 5, you would instantly know what the GM is telling you is probably false. Whereas if the GM is making you that roll, all you know is the exact same thing that your character knows, which is the information that the GM feeds you. Now if you suspect that the GM is giving you information that would indicate that you got a failure or a critical failure, you can't instantly try to re-roll the sense motive. Instead, you have to wait until something about the situation changes dramatically. What counts as a significant change is something that you're going to have to determine with your GM. It could be another big question, it could be something that someone else says, or something else that the character does. However, until that time, the information that you got from the GM is the information you have to go on. Now what really makes this fun is if someone else made a different role on their sense motive check and got different information. Then y'all have to figure out who has the accurate information. It's a real mind puzzler. The only other secret check on this list is Seek, probably the one action that people most associate with perception checks. The player is trying to scan an area for signs of creatures or objects. Then the GM will attempt a single secret perception check for you and compare the result to the stealth DCs of any undetected hidden creatures in the area or whatever DC is necessary to detect an object. Now if you want to get really finicky, you might need to select a 30 foot cone or 15 foot burst in the line of sight. And you might take a penalty if that area is far away. If you're also choosing to look for a secret object, you might search a 10 foot squared area adjacent to you. I find that to be a little persnickety myself, so I generally hand wave that stuff. But, you know, we're going over the real rules. A GM then might have you do the search activity, which generally takes 10 minutes for a character, which gives your healer plenty of time to do their thing, or your monk to be able to refocus. Using the search action, you'll instead roll the secret perception check for a searching character to detect any creatures they pass that's in a place that stands out, such as near a door, but not something that's in a more inconspicuous place, unless they're searching particularly slowly and meticulously. That'll let your GM be able to tell you about all the obvious stuff, like things in drawers, stuff that's behind doors, but maybe not things like secret doors or hidden compartments. Now if you make a successful check during combat, undetected creatures become hidden from you instead of undetected, and hidden creatures become observed by you. And if you are looking for objects, you learn about their location or get a clue to their whereabouts, as determined by the GM. However, on a critical success, undetected and hidden creatures become observed by you, and if you're searching for an object, you instantly learn its location. If you're looking for something that's invisible though, this would be a great time for those non-human characters to get to use their imprecise sense, like scent or tremor sense, to be able to detect creatures that couldn't normally be detected just with eyesight. Now if you make a successful seek but other characters don't, you can use the specialty basic action point out. So the creatures that you now see, you can indicate to your allies gesturing in the direction and describing the distance verbally. The creature is hidden to your allies rather than undetected. There are some caveats though, they have to be near you so that they can see where you're pointing, and they have to be able to hear or understand you, otherwise they have to make their own perception check against the creature's stealth DC. Now say in the course of your seeking you find a lever that you want to pull, or a chain that you want to pull or a wall sconce that you want to pull. Okay, a lot of things get pulled in the course of adventuring. For that, you would use the interact action, one of my favorite actions because it encompasses so much. You use your hand or hands to manipulate an object or the terrain. You can grab an unintended or stored object, open a door, or produce some similar effect. Interact essentially is the catch-all action for anything that isn't included on this list. If you want to do something that isn't a skill action or one of these actions, you can just make it an interact action. It's not explicitly stated, but it's generally understood that an interaction lasts only as long as the and in the sentence of whatever you're trying to do. So for example, if you pull out a potion from a satchel and then try to drink it, one manipulate action would be in the pulling out of the potion, the second interact action would be in trying to drink it. You can work out with your GM if there's more or less that you can accomplish in an interact action, but that's my general rule of thumb. And say that lever opened up a 5 foot gap? Well then you can leap. 
I didn't really have a smooth segue into doing this action, so let's just roll with it. You can leap 10 feet horizontally if you have a speed of at least 15 feet, which is most creatures. You'll land in the space where your leap ends, meaning that you can typically clear a 5-foot gap. You can also leap vertically up to 3 feet, or 5 feet horizontally onto an elevated surface. Leap doesn't require an athletic skill check unless you're trying to go longer than that 10 feet. However, if your speed is at least 30 feet, which is for most elves or creatures that take the fleet skill, then you can leap 15 feet easily, meaning that you can clear a 10 foot gap. Now, if you did happen to chance trying to leap longer than you have the ability for, you know, it happens, there's one last recourse before you plummet to your death. That's the grab and edge reaction. If you fall off or past an edge or other handhold, you can try to grab it one last time, potentially stopping your fall. You have to roll a reflex save, which is usually against the climb DC of whatever the ledge is. If you do grab the edge, then you're able to climb out. On a success, if you have a hand free, then you grab the edge. You still take damage from the distance fallen so far, but you treat the fall as though it were 20 feet shorter. However, you can't normally succeed if you don't have hands free, such as if they're tied up or if you're holding weapons or something else in both of your hands. However, if you critically succeed, then you can grab the edge, whether or not you have a hand free, by using a suitable item to catch yourself, such as using your sword or a battle axe to grab you. You do still take damage from the fall, but you still treat it as 30 feet shorter. On a critical failure though, if you fall in more than 20 feet or more, you take 10 bludgeoning damage from the impact of every 20 feet fallen. So basically you're falling and hitting your face on the side of a cliff. You can keep on trying to grab an edge until either you fall to your death or you successfully get it. Again though, if you keep on falling and you don't grab it for very long, you're going to take a lot of damage. It's worth noting here that if you have a fly speed, there are two more specialty basic actions which may help you. The first is obviously flying, which would be great to have if you're falling. It works a lot the same as movement, except for now you have a Y axis to contend with. When trying to fly upward, you use the rules for moving through difficult terrain, meaning that every 5 feet of movement that you make is treated as 10 feet. However, you can go down 10 feet for every 5 feet of movement that you spend. You do, however, need to use the fly action to continue to hover. If you don't by the end of your turn, then you're going to fall. In this case, again, if you have a fly speed, you can then use the reaction Arrest to Fall. The acrobatics DC is 15, but it might be higher due to air turbulence or other circumstances. And if you succeed, you'll fall gently, taking no damage from the fall at all. And while we're talking about special movement, let's bring up Burrow. If you have a burrow speed, you can dig your way through the dirt, or a similar loose material at the rate of your burrow speed. You can't burrow through rock or other substances denser than dirt unless you have an ability that allows you to do so. Burrow does not have all the fancy rules as fly is for moving down or up, so basically as long as you have the movement speed to burrow for whatever distance you're going, you can do it. Now we're going to talk about three of the most misunderstood basic actions. Aid, Delay, and ready. These are all actions that you might take outside of your normal turn. However, it's kind of misunderstood when exactly you apply them. So let's go in order. Let's say you want to do something, but you don't want to do it right now. The main difference between the three is when you're going to do it. If you delay, you're moving your entire turn in initiative order. If you're readying, you're using two actions on your turn to do a reaction some other time in initiative order. If you're aiding, you're just going to use one single action to attempt to aid someone else in an action that they're doing. So the difference is, again, your entire turn, a specific move that you're doing, or a specific move that someone else is doing. Delay is a free action, however you have to make it at the time that your turn begins. Say a creature that you want to interact with is way lower in initiative order, and if you were to use your turn right now, somehow you would miss on the right moment to interact with them. This is when you would want to delay your turn. The rest of your turn doesn't happen, and instead you're removed from initiative order. You can bring yourself back into initiative order whenever you want, as long as it's by the end of another creature's turn. 
You will then permanently remain there for as long as that initiative order lasts. You can't use any reactions until you return to initiative order. And if you wait too long and it gets to the end of the initiative order without you having done anything, that delayed turn is lost. Instead, your initiative won't change and your turn will occur just as it normally would. This is a pretty big decision, but it's one that can be very, very helpful. For example, say that you're a healer and your fighter is about to run through a big blaze of fire for some reason. You might have your turn before the fighter, meaning that once that fighter goes through all the fire, there's not much you're going to be able to do to help them until your next initiative turn. In this case, you might delay your entire action to wait until after the fighter goes through the fire so that you can give them some healing once they're all burned up. It will change your entire turn, however that might be more useful both for yourself and the whole rest of the party. Now one thing to note is that you can't use delay to escape any persistent damage or negative effects that would normally occur. Instead, those effects happen the moment that you use the delay action. That's right. If you're dying, fate's gonna get you either way. Now say that you want to keep your turn in initiative order, but you still want to prepare to do something. Most often I see this as someone wanting to prepare an attack outside of a hallway and basically getting an ambush ready. This is when you would use the ready action. This is the first of all of these actions that takes two actions to do. Essentially, this move allows you to create a custom reaction. You will use these two actions to choose a single action or free action that you can use, and then you're going to designate a trigger. In our example, that trigger might be someone comes through the doorway. If that trigger happens before your next turn, then you can choose to use the action like a reaction. A thing to keep in mind is that if you used an attack action before you used ready, that readied action, if it's going to be an attack, is going to take the multiple attack penalty. So if you did a strike, and then readied an attack action, that attack action would have a multiple attack penalty of minus five. Aid, I think, is a little confusing because of how they symbolized it in the book. All they have is a reaction symbol, when really I think it would be better to have an action symbol plus a reaction symbol. Say one of your allies is going to try to pick a lock. You also have proficiency with thievery, and you want to help them. However, they're lower in initiative order than you are. You can use a single action to prepare to help that ally with the task. During your turn, you describe to the GM exactly how you're trying to help. For our example, that might be you trying to coach your ally into how to properly pick a lock because they don't know what the hell they're doing. Then that's all that you do until you're ready to use the reaction. When the ally is ready to accept your aid, that's when you'll make a skill check or attack roll of the type determined by your GM. Typically the DC is 20, but they might adjust it depending on how easy or hard the task is. On a success, you'll grant a plus one bonus to the triggering check. On a critical success, you'll grant them a plus two. However, if you're a master, then you get to give them a plus three, or if you're a legendary, then you get to give them a plus four. On a critical failure though, your ally will take a minus one circumstance penalty to the triggering check. So, be sure that you can actually help them when you want to try to help them. Your ally will then try to make their own skill attempt and then add whatever circumstance bonus or penalty you gave them. The main difference between aid and ready is that ready is something that you're going to do yourself. While with aid, you're trying to help usually a skill check. There's three more specialty basic actions that I want to cover for this episode. But before we do that, let's get some housekeeping out of the way. So obviously, I've been gone for a while. And in that time, I've made a couple of big changes. For one, I've gotten rid of Patreon. No one told me to do it, I just decided that I wasn't meeting my obligation as a content creator to be able to charge people money in exchange for rewards of really any kind. I do, however, want to give a hearty thanks to every single person who was a Patreon supporter for the time that I had it up. I just really didn't think it was fair of me to be charging you money while not providing my own end in giving you rewards that you deserve. If you are still dead set on giving me money, you can do that at RuleLord2E.com. That goes to my Anchor profile, and there's a way for you to sign up to give monthly donations. However, please. Don't do it 
until I've at least managed to come up with a couple more episodes and shown that I can be a reliable content creator. I don't need the money, but I do appreciate it. This is, however, a one-way transaction. There's no extra benefits to donating, though maybe I'll get to see your name and I'll try to give you a shout out on the podcast. That'll give me a little bit less stress to feel like I'm not living up to my obligations. This change, however, also opens up another opportunity that you can also do at RulerTui.com. At the start of this episode, you heard the community use policy agreement that Omen Podcast graciously donated to me. On my Anchor page, which again you can get to by going to RulerTui.com, you can send me your own voice message. This was previously something that I only had available to Patreon supporters, but now I'm opening it up to everyone. If you want to send me your special community policy use agreement, go to RulerTui.com and record the message. Simply record a brief little message with your name and maybe a shout out to someone special, and then read out the community use agreement. Based on quality and time submitted, I'll add it to the next episode when it comes out. I'll put this in the description of every single podcast so that you remember where it is and how to find it, but I'd really look forward to hearing all of your messages and being able to make it a part of my program permanently. The Anchor page really does everything that I want, so that's going to be the main hub for RuleLord2E.com from this moment on. I'm going to try to do shorter, more condensed episodes. This will allow me to do more regular shows and mean that I'll have a lot more need for your community use policy agreement, so make sure that you go on and do one. My hiatus has unfortunately probably hurt my search engine optimization, but something that you could do to help me get back on my feet is leave a review. Both iTunes and now Spotify allow you to add reviews or at least ratings on the podcast page. You can reach both by going to ruler2e.com and either going to the iTunes page if you listen on iTunes or Spotify if you use Spotify, and please leave a review. That would be super duper awesome and really would help me out. So remember to like, subscribe, and re- Oh, oh my god. Oh my god, I sound like a YouTuber right now. Oh god, no! But it really does help me out. Oh god. All right, with that out of the way, let's cover the last three actions. First one is mount. If you're adjacent to a creature that's at least one size larger than you and is willing to be mounted, you can move on to the creature and ride it. You don't need to make a nature check or anything like that. You can also use the action to dismount if you're already on it, moving off the mount into a space adjacent to it. Raising a shield is a single action that requires you to have a shield. However, if you have a shield, when you raise it, you gain its circumstance bonus to AC. Your shield remains raised until the start of your next turn. Finally, a very useful but very specialized move if you're facing basilisks or medusas is avert gaze. You avert your gaze from danger and gain a plus two circumstance bonus to saves against visual abilities that require you to look at a creature or object such as a Medusa's petrifying gaze. Your gaze remains averted until the start of your next turn. Oh my god, that's all the actions! Well, not all of them. There's a lot of actions that are hidden inside of skills or granted by feats from classes. However, these 24 actions are available to everyone. You could, theoretically, play an entire game only using these actions. However, the ones that we're going to cover next time are going to make it even more fun. For the next couple episodes, I'm going to cover each of the skills, as well as all the actions and effects inside of them. After that, we'll start going into conditions as well as traits. That should probably take up most of 2022. I'm also going to try to throw in an interview, maybe with some Paizo developers or third-party product developers, as well as maybe just some things when I feel like shooting some... I shouldn't curse on this episode. But I've had some ideas on some bonus content, and so I'm going to be throwing that in every once in a while, just to take little mini breaks from having to cover the rules. So for those, let me know what you're interested in. Who do you think I should interview? Who do you think I should be interviewed by? What do you want me to talk about? You can let me know on Twitter, again, at RuleLord2E.com. 
I try to be very good about interacting with people, either giving a like at least to acknowledge that I saw it, or directly replying. I know I'm so gracious and magnanimous. And again, if you're a podcaster or YouTuber and want to send me a 30 second promo, you can do that at rulord2e at gmail.com and I might put it on the episode. It'd be great if you gave me a shout out in return on your own content, but I'm not going to demand it or any kind of monetary compensation. I just want to be able to get more Pathfinder goodness out there in the world. So what'd you think? Was the wait worth it? Are you looking for more Pathfinder 2nd Edition coverage on Rise of the Rule Lords? Let me know at rulelord2e.com. And until the next session, don't let the rules rule you!